presentation from Luca Souza. Luca is a research scientist at Nomenta, uh, which is a company which is focused on neocortical theory. And uh, his main work is to bridge and bring this theory, neocortical principles, to AI. And of course, Luca will speak about us, uh, speak to us about his research. So over to you, Luca. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, thanks for saying uh, all this long. I know it's the last talk of today, but uh, so what, what I'm hoping to do in the next 30 minutes is to convince you of uh, this statement right there, that the future of neural networks is sparse. And I'm going to start by talking a little bit about uh, our company, about Nementa. Oops. So Nementa was founded in 2005 by uh, Jeff Hawkins and Donald Dubinsky. Uh, they were behind other companies such as Palm and Handspring, and they took it all the way to IPO. And Nementa has a dual mission. One of them is to reverse engineer the neocortex. And so we try to come up with biologically accurate theories and all our publications are open access, and open, open access journals. And the other part of the mission is to apply those principles to AI. And so we hope to improve current AI techniques and move toward a truly intelligent systems by doing that. So we are right at the intersection of neuroscience and computer science. So it's been a long ride, so long years. We've uh, I've done a lot of stuff, as you can see. Um, so we, we went, we've done a lot of theory. We also built some products. Uh, we have patents and some companies spin off the Menta. And so our latest work is in doing, uh, in showing speed improvements on deep learning using sparse neural networks. Uh, that's our, our latest published work. And Jeff has a book coming up uh, this year, actually just came out last week, uh, that uh, talks about all the, the things we, we discovered in the last few years. So our path from neural network to machine intelligence. So if some of you are familiar with Numenta, uh, from I think 2009 to 2016, we were working with an algorithm called HTM, Hierarchical Temporal Memory, which was uh, a very neuroscience inspired based on Jeff's first book and his ideas. And HTM was it's really good at some tasks, not so good at others. Uh, so what we have been doing since I think 2017 is we, we're getting the main principles from HTM and we are applying them to modern deep learning. And what we hope to do is, is to get the good parts of HTM and use them to, to improve current deep learning. So some of these things, uh, one of them is sparsity and sparsity leads to improved performance and improved robustness as I'm gonna show. Uh, other things we're working on is on active dendrites, so moving away from the, the point neuron to, uh, to neurons that look like uh, a, neuron that, uh, a neuron that's in our brain, and that's going to help us do continuous learning. Uh, reference frames, uh, so work with invariant representations and fast learning, and less cortical columns, uh, and that's going to help in sensory model learning and robotics. So those, those last two areas are the, the forefront, are the things we're talking about every day. Sparse and active dendrites, we're already at this stage of implementing the machine learning and getting uh, very interesting results. So some of our most recent papers in neuroscience are listed here, but uh, they're all uh, open. They're easy to find, they're all open. So just if you're interested, you can Google, you can easily find them. And talking about the book, so Jeff just released a new book, came out last week. I actually have it here. And it's called A Thousand Brains in New Theory of Intelligence. So if you're interesting, I'd highly recommend it. But uh, I'm not gonna talk about the book, uh, neither about uh, the neuroscience part, because I'm not a neuroscientist, I'm a machine, machine learning uh, engineer, like most of you here. So, but I'll start my talk by justifying, uh, and in fact, that's the question that everyone asks me at first, is what does the brain has to do with artificial neural networks, right? So after all, it's in just a big stack of logistic regression layers. And before that, just talk a little bit about the brain. Yeah, that's that the picture on the right is, is the picture we usually uh, see of the brain. So it's like, a, a, it's a lateral view. And what you can see there is usually the neocortex. So the neocortex uh, is 70% of the human brain if you measure by volume. And it's this sheet, which is like the, as thick as a napkin uh, and as big as a, a table napkin. 
and it's on top of the brain, but it has to fit this cold, so you have to kind of compress it. That's why it looked like this. And and that's the organ which is responsible for most of the things uh, humans do that differentiate us from other animals. So all mammals have a neocortex, not just humans, but uh, ours is, is significantly larger. And so it, it's known as the organ of intelligence. So it's responsible for uh, processing uh, sensory inputs, uh, uh, delivering motor actions for all sort of abstract engineering, science, philosophy. And some of the, the attributes that we're trying to incorporate into deep learning is it, it learns continuously. It learns fast with few examples. It's very efficient, and it can learn thousands of diverse tasks uh, without forgetting the others. So, those are very important traits that we, we, we have to look uh, at current machine learning and, and try to understand why it's not there, and then look at the brain and understand why it's there and see how we can bridge that gap. And the brain is our only existence proof of intelligence. So if you think about it, some of the main breakthroughs in deep learning came from neuroscience inside. So since the, the first neural model from McCulloch and Pitts, 43, uh, for, to the perceptron from Rosenblatt, 58, which is inspired on, on Donald Help models for learning from 1950, uh, convolutional networks from uh, Fukushima in the 80s, this is based on the visual cortex models proposed by uh, Hubble and Vizio many years before. Uh, recurrent networks by uh, Hopfield in 82 and restricted both by machine by Hinton in 2006. Those are all based in uh, associative memory and attraction models, which is a model we have in computational neuroscience. And finally, attention models from uh, Benji 2014 and later transformed it's based on the role of thalamus and research into consci consciousness. Uh, and the last one, I mean, we're not there yet, but. <laughs> I want to include here is sparse neural networks, which is a topic I'm going to talk about. So uh, why sparse? And let's start by going back to the brain and just define it. So in the brain, connections are sparse. So connections, I mean, the connections between one neuron and, and another. So there are approximately 85 billion neurons in the brain, but each neuron has up to 15,000 connections only. And not every neuron can be connected to every neuron. It depends, uh, there's uh, some regions of the brain can only be connected to another, but if you account for all possible connections a neuron can have, uh, that number uh, 15,000, that's only one to 5% of all possible connections. So it's, it's super sparse. Uh, the population dynamics is also sparse. So you probably heard that only a small amount of neurons is active at the same time. And that's between 0.5 to 2%. So if you, if you look here on the video, that's a, that's a mouse cortex and the lights are showing individual neurons firing. And it's always only a small percentage. And that led to, you probably had some like a popular, some crazy theory saying that, oh, we only use a small part of the brain. If you use everything, and then we're gonna be super smart. And if you use everything, that's just a plot too, right? We're not going to be super smart. We're just going to be non-functional because there is a value in sparsity and uh, it's the way we represent things. And not only that, but also our brain requires sparsity to have that the efficiency to use the amount of energy we do. So if you activate all of them at the same time, uh, that's, that's not going to be viable uh, for our brain. Uh, learning is also sparse. So only a small amount of synapses of a neuron uh, are reinforced during learning. And what I mean that if you look at these two neural models here, uh, you have the one on the left, which is sending a, a signal through this axon, and the one on the right is going to receive it through, through a dendrite. So this here is the dendritic tree. And in order for this neuron to activate, the, the threshold of the soma has to go, the, the, the voltage of the soma has to go above a threshold. And it doesn't need all dendrites to, to fire. So, so this neuron connects here. It's gonna, uh, it's gonna uh, tr transmit through this uh, synapses here. This is a picture of synaptic left. And one dendritic tree is enough to activate the whole neuron. So that this is gonna make it fire and then transmit signal to the next one. And if that happens, only these connections here that were responsible for that, they're gonna be reinforced. The other ones are not gonna be reinforced. And in the long run, what that means is only if only this one fires and the others don't. So this, these are the paths you're going to reinforce. And it, it's one out of many. So learning is also sparse within the neuron. And just out of curiosity, this is a, 
a neuron 3D model. And this is how it looks like. So this is the SOMA, this is a, what we call parameter model. This is the SOMA. Uh, these are the dendritic trees here. That's a, so other neurons are gonna connect here through the dendritic trees. And here is the axon, which sends the signal. And, and finally, the activation during neuron life cycle is sparse. So neurons rarely activate. That's a phenomenon known as lifetime sparseness or lifetime kurtosis. And it has been suggested that some neurons only activate once or just a few times during their entire life cycle. And so if you want to know more about sparsity of the brain, I recommend this talk here by uh, our BPF research of Tamat. He is a neuroscientist and not, so <laughs> uh, I've picked up a few things over the years, but uh, I'm not the expert on I mean. it. So why is your brain sparse? So one, one of the main reasons has to do with energy efficiency. So the brain only consumes 20 watts per day. Uh, that's a light bulb, a small light bulb. And in 80 years of life, the total energetic cost of your brain, if you consider like learning and inference, it's 585 kilowatts. Uh, in contrast, we take GPT-2, and if you include all the iterations that were required to get the final model, uh, the energetic cost is 82,000 kilowatts. And that's equivalent to the cost of 140 brains through the entire life cycle. Imagine what we can do with 140 brains for 80 years, probably better than GPT-2, right? And GPT-2 has 1.5 billion parameters. GPT-3 is a hundred times bigger. It has 175 billion parameters and the cost of training is thousands of petaflops. Uh, it's estimated to uh, four to 12 million just to train one round of GPT-3. So you can imagine how many more brains you need to train GPT-3 in terms of uh, energetic cost. So how does sparse connections look? Uh, uh, on the left, we have uh, a picture of the brain, not really a picture, but uh, a representation. So at birth, uh, we have very few connections. The neurons are there, we have very few connections. And during the first years of development, they, they're gonna grow, a lot of connections are gonna grow. And after that period, and that I think that picks around six to eight years, I'm not sure, I think, yeah, I think it's eight. Uh, the connection, the synapses, are, are, they start to be pruned and they're gonna be pruned for the rest of your life. They're gonna be gradually pruned. So we start like that, uh, we gradually grow a lot and then we prune a lot. So it's uh, one of the hypotheses that pruning is learning as well. And, and that's one way to, uh, of uh, going to life and capture new things. So we start, you can think of, we start with all possible hypotheses and then we narrow down just to the hypothesis we, we, we think are more probable during life. And, and this is how it looks like neural networks. So this is a fully connected neural network, one that you're probably very familiar with. And what, when I talk about sparse connections, I just mean remove some of these connections. So not every neuron is gonna be connected to every neuron. And connections can also be called weights or parameters. So you're gonna hear me using those three words interchangeably. So let's move on to, to machine learning. And I wanna start by asking this, the question of what, what is the real relevance of the weights in the neural network? And we are inclined to think that all, all knowledge is in the weights, right? That, that's how we see a neural network, but is it? So first paper I wanna mention is by uh, Gary Ha, 2019. These are Google Brain researchers. It's called Weight, Weight Diagnostic Neural Networks. And what they do here is uh, using evolutionary algorithms, they, they explore the space of topology, adding one connection at a time. So the end result is gonna be uh, a sparse network. So they're not adding all connections. They're only adding the required connections. And what they show in this paper is that it's possible to learn a task by searching only in the space of topologies. So here, this is a reinforcement learning task. So this metric here is a reward. Yeah, you can see, Okay, this first test here. So fixed topology is just like regular neural network. And if you, if you assign it random weight, it's not gonna learn. If you assign a random shared weight between uh, all nodes, it's also not gonna learn. Same thing if you try to tune that only single way. But if you tune all the weight, that's just regular training, it, it learns. And by contrast, the one on the top, that's the, the network that was grown by this model. It's not gonna learn if you assign random weights, uh, but if you assign one, random shared weight uh, throughout the network, uh, it also performs at least uh, half as good as uh, the full one. And, and here you're not changing the weights at all. So 
uh, all that you learn is the topology of the network. Uh, if you go a little bit further and if you tune that single way, so there is only one way that's shared, same value shared across all units, but you're gonna tune only that, you already have a performance which is very close to the one where you tune all weights independently. And so what, what this paper is showing is that just by learning the topology, uh, there's, there's a lot of value there. Uh, another paper also by, by Google Brain Research is called uh, Are All Layers Created Equal? Did a very interesting experiment where they, they, they get a train network, in this case it's ResNet50 on ImageNet, and they reinitialize all weights of a layer to an earlier training epoch. So what you can see here on the left is the epoch that was uh, reinitialized to. So I think this was trained for 200 epochs. So here they reinitialize uh, to the 100th epoch, the, here to the 10th, uh, all the way to the start of the training. And it, what is shown here is that for several of, several of these layers, reinitializing the weight has little to no effect on the final accuracy. So here they reinitialize like one at a time. So this is a sensitivity analysis. And if you see here for these middle layers of the ResNet, uh, you can completely randomize them and there's gonna be no impact to accuracy at all. So, so keep in mind, this is a train network and, and, and they just randomize this layer. And what they, their hypothesis here is that the, this middle layers are act, acting just as, as random nonlinear linear transformations. It doesn't really matter what sort of transformation they're doing, uh, as long as that is within that same space. And this, the first and the last layers are, are the ones that matter most. And, and the plot on the bottom is, so I put a little twist to that experiment. And I try that uh, instead of reinitializing the weights, I sparsify the weight, so I remove them all together. So if we don't, if they have no relevance, that means we don't need them. And you can see the exact same behavior with pruning. So the plot on the bottom is from my research. And you can see that for some of this layer, and it looks a lot like the one on the top, you can sparsify up to 99% of the connections. So you're gonna remove 99% of the connections of that layer, and that has little to no effect on the model final accuracy. And it's not an easy test, it's a really hard test. That's ResNet50 on ImageNet. And this is like a state-of-the-art model. So it's not, uh, it's not like the model is overfitted or it has extra capacity. It's already on the limit of its capacity. And so, so what, I, what I'm doing here, so I started talking about pruning. And I think it's uh, important to make a reference to this paper by LeCun uh, for 93 called Optimal Brain Damage. So, these ideas of pruning and sparsity, they have been discussed for a long time. I think this is a, a landmark paper for 93, uh, where uh, Lacan applies some of these ideas. And what, what he shows is that by removing unimportant weights from a network, that several improvements can be expected. And among them is better generalization, uh, fewer training examples required, improved the speed of learning, or, or better classification. And in this paper, specifically, he uses some second derivative information to as a salience metric to determine which weights can be pruned. But uh, follow-up papers, they, they have been focused on magnitude, which is also a good salience metric. And for very large networks, it's easier to compute. So uh, keep in mind, Lacan here was working for a small network. Uh, recently, 2020, 2021, uh, I've seen some papers coming back to that idea of uh, secondary information now that we have uh, better ways of calculating them, and we have uh, implemented frameworks for that. So that's that's another option. But most of the work I'm going to show it's based on its magnitude based pruning. So we remove connections with uh, with a greater magnitude. So you're probably familiar with that. So let's cut from '93 to 2019, and I'm sure you're all familiar with the lottery ticket hypothesis that won the best paper uh, award in IQ 2019. That's an excellent uh, investigation by Franklin Carbon and Carbing. And what they show is that it exists an optimal topology or a subnetwork for, uh, for a given neural network. And that can be found by progressively eliminating connections based on some importance criteria, in this case, it's magnitude, uh, reinitializing the weights to the initial value and retrain the network. So uh, let, let's go back to the process here. So they get a, a network and they train it uh, in a test. And at the end of it, they're gonna look at the connections 
And the ones which have uh, lower weight, they're, they're just gonna remove it. Uh, they're gonna deem it unnecessary. And then they're gonna retrain it for it. So they initialize the weights to the initial value and retrain the network again. And they do that several times. And every time they remove a, a percentage of the weight, let's say 10% each time. Uh, and the end result, you can see here that with, if you only have like 3% of the weight in the end, like five to 3% of the weight in the end, you can have equal or better accuracy than the original model. And keep it, so here networks like 20 times smaller and you actually have better results than the original model. So, uh, and this was also a landmark paper. I mean, it showed the power of learning and the relevance of learning the topology for uh, neural networks. And since have been a lot of follow-up papers, one of them, which is very interesting is Supermass uh, from Ju et al. That's from a uh, Uber AI Labs group. And what they show here is, so they take that uh, one step forward and they show that they can achieve over 80% accuracy, 86% accuracy back that in this task, this is a mini, a mini task here, without even retraining the network and using only the initial values. So what they do is they train the entire network, uh, they prune it, they prune a lot, like 90% of the network, and reinitialize the weight and don't even train it again. And that's enough to, to, to learn about 86, um, percent uh, have 86 percent accuracy in MNEs, which is a lot better than 10 percent, which would be the random one. So keep in mind, since the weights are being initialized, they're random. And all you have here at this point is the topology. And the topology is enough to have 86 percent accuracy. And you can even have this result if you set all the weights just to a constant. And all that matters is that constant has the same sign as the weight's initial value. So that constant is going to be if the weight was positive at the beginning, you just put it as plus one. If it was negative, you put it as minus one. And it's enough to have 86% accuracy. So again, he is just showing the power of uh, learning the subnetwork uh, to, uh, to, learn, to learn the task. And like I said, there have been very interesting follow-up papers. This is by Ramanujan, uh, Ramanujan et al, 2020. Uh, what's hidden in a randomly weighted neural network. And he shows that randomly weighted neural networks contain subnetworks, which can achieve impressive performance without modifying the weight values. So his work here is not even training the weights, he's only training the mask. And uh, I'm not gonna go into details for this process, uh, I really recommend this paper, but what he does here is for each edge, he assigns a score. And then in the forward pass, he selects some of these ads, like a top gate, and he, uh, he updates it on the backward pass using a straight to estimator. And so if that connection was relevant for uh, the end result, it's gonna be, uh, so the score is gonna increase. If it wasn't relevant, the score is gonna decrease. And at the end, you can prune based on that score. So you're gonna have a score that indicates the importance of each connection. And the weights are fixed, the weights are never trained. And a, a follow-up paper that came about at the same time, it's called Supermask and Superposition by Wurzman et al, 2020, show that you can use this technique to learn thousands of tasks without catastrophic forgetting using just fixed space network and finding this subnetwork or this supermask that achieves good performance in each task. So what you're gonna do here is you, you, the model is gonna be the same. You're not gonna touch the model once you initialize it. And out that you're gonna learn a subnetworks. And this is very efficient because the super mask, the binary, uh, you only have to know if that connection is active or not. So it's binary. And then base network is fixed. And since it's fixed, you don't have to store all the weights. You only have to store the seed because you can recreate it again every time. So it doesn't matter how big is your model. You can have one trillion parameters model. All you need to start to reproduce this network is one number, which is the seed to recreate it. And then you start a super mask for each task, but the super mask again, they are binary. So they're very easy to store. So how do you, let me do a time check. I'm running a bit late, but I think it's fine. So how to train sparse neural networks? That's a big question here. And uh, when I talk first about this paper from uh, Mokano et al, 2018, they're from uh, Eindhoven University. And this was a nature paper and at, the, at this point, 2018, they showed this very uh, simple experiment, but also 
eye-opening, showing that you can start this parse network and during training, you can search in the space of topology. And they propose a simple heuristic where weights of smaller magnitude they remove at each epoch, and then an equivalent number of weights is randomly added. And they show that even this simple heuristic, uh, and th this is the red line here, it performs better than a regular neural network, regular dense neural network, and a lot better than a net, uh, network with a fixed sparsity. And the now you can see the number of weights here is this like five percent, um, two to five percent of the original multilayer perceptron. But uh, this is a simple problem. This is cipher then uh, this is a multilayer perceptron. But since then, a lot of people have replicated this in, in bigger uh, models and bigger data sets. One of them is dynamic sparse uh, reparameterization by Mustafa and Wang 2019. They were Intel researchers at the time. And um, the latest one is uh, the state of the art right now. Well, not right now, but until six months ago was rigging the lottery ticket by uh, Google researchers, it's also called Regal. And, and they show here that using these methods of during training you search in that space, uh, they are able to achieve performance which is on pair with the lottery ticket. And keep in mind that this is a lot more efficient than lottery tickets, because in lottery ticket you train it all the way to the end and then you prune a little bit and then you train it again. Here, they, they're sparse from start and during the course of training, they're changing that set of connections and, and they are able to achieve uh, about the same level of accuracy that's equal to SAT and even better than regular dense networks. Uh, another way of doing this is starting as a dense network and moving to sparse, so like pruning, but you do that uh, continuously during training. So you're moving from dense to sparse. Uh, we, we also do that. We have our own algorithm at Lumenta and the way uh, we do it. So we have used most of these algorithms as well. And we came up with our own, uh, with work by uh, Marcus Lewis, it's, it's still unpublished. And, and the idea here is very simple, is that we, uh, we're gonna associate a Gaussian probability with each weight. And, and that's gonna be simple from this normal distribution with mean one and deviation alpha ij. And we are gonna regularize that this alpha ij during training. So basically what we're doing is we're injecting noise into the weight. And we're gonna train this with a straight through estimator, which is similar to variational dropout. So as, as we increase alpha ij, uh, what, what we're trying to do here is uh, by adding this noise, we want the weights to, uh, to be more quantizable, to, to be easier to quantize at the end. So if I, if I reduce the number of bits I have to represent each weight at the end, uh, I can still have a similar performance. And the way you use this for pruning is uh, as we increase alpha ij, this, uh, the distribution here is gonna get wider. And as soon as, soon as this y distribution starts to get, so as soon as the curve includes zero, that means uh, there is a probability that in each pass, uh, that weight's just gonna be zero. So we might as well prune it anyway. And so we're gonna use this information to, uh, to prune our network. And then the side effect, or the, what we're looking for is that they're also easier to quantize. Uh, you can also not, there's dense to sparse, sparse to sparse, sparse, but you can also just try to find that topology at the start before training, which is called foresight pruning. And so one of the first works in that is single shot, uh, single shot network pruning or SNP. And they prune less important connections for a given task by uh, measuring the sensitivity to the graded or to prune their connection. So they prune one connection, see how the gradient changes, and they do that for every connection. So it's time consuming, but you only do it once at initialization. And SNP is data set dependent, but there are other alternatives which are independent of the data set. And they try to preserve the norm of the gradient and, and the gradient flow. And I'll leave some references here. So, oh, it says I have two minutes. Can I, can I still talk for five or six or? The two minutes, okay. I still have a few slides. So sparse flare. So I've been talking about sparse uh, uh, connections, but there's another aspect of it, which is sparse activations. And what that means is, so ReLU, if you apply ReLU to a central dis distribution, for example, after you do batch norm without uh, fine parameters, uh, you, you have on average 50% of the activation set to zero, right? Because ReLU is gonna cut at zero. Uh, K-winner is a more sparse version of the activation function. So in K-winners, 
you only select uh, a few of the weights and you determine. So if the K winners is set to two out of six, for example, in this last case, you would only, for all these uh, activations, you will, would only select 1.7, 1.1, so the highest ones. And you can do that by ranking, but there are also other ways of doing that. So if you know the distribution beforehand, you can infer what the threshold is and, and you can use that uh, modified threshold to, to cut your activations and know which ones are, are gonna go through, uh, go forward or not. So that would be like ReLU, but ReLU is a moving threshold. And, and the surface of this loss function, it's less convex and less move. And you can think of, oh, it's less convex, so it's not gonna be amenable to learning, but that's not true. And we've been working with that for two years now. We've run, run hundreds of experiments, uh, uh, all sorts of, of scenarios, big data sets, and it doesn't have a big impact and other people found the same. And the truth is we don't really know how neural networks work. We have this idea of, you know, convex optimization functions, but we don't really know if that's what's going on. So uh, what we've seen empirically is, yes, so this is, even if the uh, loss surface looks like this, we can still learn. And as a benefit, what you get is, uh, these models, they are more robust to noise. So you can see here, it, this is our own work by Martin Chinkman, showing that uh, the, this networks on the top, this is noise and accuracy. So as you increase the noise, uh, regular networks, they, they drop very fast. And that actually drops very fast, where this, the, the sparse networks, they, they are a lot more robust to, to adding noise to the input. And it's also more uh, robust white box adversary attacks because since it's, it's gonna be harder to, uh, to infer the grade. So white, bo white box adversary attacks, they're gonna try to um, uh, investigate, they're gonna try to investigate what sort of uh, small changes, small perturbations you can do to the gradient to, to trick the network. And since the loss surface looks like this, it's gonna be a lot harder to do that. And, and the gains from sparse rate and sparse activations, they're multiplied. So if you think about uh, if the connection is sparse and the activation is sparse, if the connections that get in here in the next layer is sparse and also, the, uh, and also here, the, the weights from that neuron are gonna be sparse. What we have is if the network's 25% sparse in connections and 25% uh, sparse in activations, you actually only have 6.25% uh, of the multiplies that will be non-zero. So if it's one, one fourth, one fourth, you're gonna have one sixteen of multiplies will be non-zero. So some of the networks you run, they are like 90% uh, sparse connection, 90% sparse uh, activation. So we only have like 1% of the multiplies to be non-zero. So what are some of the next steps? Uh, what is missing for in order for uh, the community to adopt this? So one, it's like more focused on efficiency. So our current benchmarks, they take into account accuracy or similar performance measures. And this has a side effect of restricting innovation to large groups, which have access to more computational, computational power. And some examples of combined performance would be like accuracy over flops, that takes into account training time of accuracy over bytes, that takes into account weight size and memory. And MLPerf is, is one of those benchmarks that has been uh, pushing this idea forward. And sparse networks can mean uh, more efficient, can mean more robustness, but they can also mean better access just by building bigger models. So one of the benefits is, yes, you can put it on edge devices because they're not big. Uh, they have smaller uh, energy costs, but you can also just make a network bigger. And what we have seen in language models is that the performance follows a power law and bigger models training larger data sets, the results improve end results. And there's no limit in size. So you can keep making these networks bigger. And if you show that sparse neural networks have the same performance of dense neural networks in terms of accuracy, uh, that means you can use that to just make your networks bigger and, and have same, uh, same model size and same computational cost. And so with sparse quantized neural networks, we can, we, we've shown here in our own work that we can reduce inference costs up to 5X without affecting accuracy of the model. I have some results here on the right. If you, if you allow for a small reduction in accuracy that can scale up to 10X, and that can also be extended to other models such as transformers, and that's the research we're doing right now. Uh, if you use dynamic sparse models using those training methods I showed and mixed precision, we can extend these benefits to training too, not just inference. But uh, both gains, they can only be reali realized if you have specialized hardware platforms. So 
uh, because it doesn't matter if you have GPUs, you are doing uh, matrix to matrix multiplication, even though there's zero, uh, there's not a needed benefit unless you, you smartly take that into account. So the hardware manufacturers have been looking at into that. So this is a graph from uh, the white paper by NVIDIA when they introduced Ampere. And here they show that network pruning has been a hot topic in the last years and uh, NVIDIA Ampere takes advantage of that and leverage sparsity for faster training. And we have done some work on FPGAs and Xilinx FPGAs and we show here how the throughput of sparse networks compared to uh, a dense network. And these are 90% sparse networks. So here's a link to white paper if you're interested. And uh, there are new hardware platforms for machine learning, which are being developed with the focus on sparsity first. And just to cite a few of them, we have Graphcore IPUs, we have Cerebras, we have uh, Rain Neuromorphic, and they're all putting sparse as uh, first uh, citizen in their architecture. And block sparse is a lot more amenable to hardware optimization. So a lot of this work I'm showing you with hardware, we're using this block sparse, so it's not unstructured sparse is structure. And here's like an example for an open AI paper. This is for our own train uh, ResNet network that work we're submitting to a mail perf. This is, how it, the, this is how it looks like for one layer after it's learned. So in summary, uh, what I wanna say is studying the brain is important for machine learning. So a lot of these insights, uh, they lead to breakthroughs in machine learning. So we should be looking at the brain as our only proof of existence of uh, intelligence. Uh, we should adopt the key principles. So we have to understand which are the most important aspects and try to translate those to machine learning theory and apply them. Uh, sparsity specifically is key to scalable neural networks. So I really believe the future of neural networks is gonna be sparse and we're gonna see that transition in the next few years. And, but the hardware has to support sparsity. So as soon as, as we have hardware that leverage those gains, we're really gonna see this, uh, these ideas uh, gain traction in the community. So thank you. Uh, here's some of my contacts. Uh, this is some of our team members in, uh, in the holiday party. Just want to acknowledge them as well. And yeah, I would take any questions if you have it. Thank you very much, Lucas, for the very interesting uh, talk. And before we go into the questions, uh, let me remind you that there is a poll session just next to the chat function and where you can read the, the talk. So please use that as well. And then the questions. Istvan asks, does this technique have an impact on the amount of training data required to achieve the same accuracy? Uh, no, no. So that's not the beauty of it. So those methods with which I talk about dynamic sparsity, with the same number of epochs, we can find that topology during training. So there, there is a smart way of initializing them to like preserve gradient flow. And then you use those techniques to prune and grow connections during training. And at the end, you get this network, this sparse network of optimal topology, same results as this network and same amount of training, no extra training required. Thanks. Another question from Peter. You touched upon many weights Purring uh, technique. What is the best method to decide what weights are important in your opinion? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. So I'm going to reframe it like what, what is a good sensitive metric that we can use to, uh, a good salience metric that we can use to decide if uh, weight can be pruned or not. So a lot of this work is using magnitude, some uh, absolute value of the absolute magnitude of the weight. Uh, there's also a lot of recent work using second derivatives, which is what uh, Lacun originally proposed, but at the time it was hard to do with larger networks. Uh, I would say uh, magnitude is usually good enough, and I, I didn't go into detail in many of these methods, but it usually goes by at each epoch, you look at the magnitude, and the more recent ones, they look at it globally, so they allow the amount of sparsity to fluctuate between layers. So at the end, you're gonna have a network which is gonna be more dense in some layers, like I showed like in the first and the last layer and more sparse in, in the irrelevant layers like the middle ones. And, and they would grow also by using some form of metric, but usually magnitude. Uh, not, so growing will either be random or you can uh, track the gradient even for the dead weight and you can use the magnitude of the gradient to decide which weights you grow back. So. I think, yeah, magnitude would be the, a good salience metric here. Yeah, and the connected question. 
you mentioned that uh, you can first prune the neural network layers, then second the weights. Is there any significance of the order? I mean, is it better prune weights first than layers? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't get the first question. Yeah. <laughs> Again, uh, you mentioned that you can <clears throat> prune uh, the neural network layer, then second the weights. Is there uh, any significance of the order? If we right, change right. the order, for instance. Right, right. So we are not pruning the entire layer. So the layer is still there. We're pruning uh, some weights of the layer, but we allow, we are going to prune it not, uh, not in a balanced way. So we're going to prune more from some layers and less from other layers. So there is not really uh, a specific order on how you do that. So uh, the way we do it, like sparse is sparse, we just randomly initialize. So at the beginning, we don't know uh, what is the optimal sparse. So we're just going to uh, uniformly distribute that amount of weights between layers. And as we learn that, that is going to fluctuate, but we're not pruning the entire layer, we're just pruning uh, weights of a layer. Another question from Istvan. Sparse network means smaller amount of information. Would it be possible to design a smaller dense network instead? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and that's a question that always comes up. And if you open every, uh, uh, every paper related to pruning, uh, the first plot you see is comparing like a large dense network, a large sparse network to a small dense network. And what we've seen repeatedly is uh, the performance of the sparse network a lot better. It's usually on pair with the large dense. Whereas if you get the same number of parameters and you build a small denser version, you lose a lot of, uh, of performance. So it's not just a matter of uh, amount of information because well, it might be, but you have to consider that the information is not just on the weight, and that's what I'm trying to argue here. The information is also in the topology. So the topology itself carries a lot of information. And if the network's dense, you don't have that. Uh, you, you lose that aspect of, uh, of it. Uh, 